Blog Talk Radio. Hello, this is Brian Carrington. And welcome to Blog Talk Radio. Uh, we've got a few technical issues right now. Hopefully people can hear us. Uh, basically, uh, you are listening to Call Talk for Wednesday, December 8, 2010. And our topic today is site selection. What does the research show are the key success factors? And I uh, want to ask really quick, uh, Bruce, can, can you hear me there? Are you on the line? Absolutely. I'm here, Brian, and uh, ready to roll. Okay, super. That's good. good to hear. We'll keep on trucking then. And uh, also, uh, Kristen, I want to double-check that you can hear us as well. Yes, I am. Thank you for having me. Excellent. Okay. So if you are listening live, we invite you to be a part of the show and ask questions. You can by emailing us at calltalk at benchmarkportal.com, or you can chat with us on calltalk.tv. You can also call in and talk to us on the show and ask our host a question in person by dialing 347 857 3117. But make sure to press the number one on your phone to let us know you have a question. Everyone who asks a question on the show, whether email or phone, will receive a free copy of Bruce's book, Benchmarking at its Best. And one person will be chosen at random to win an in depth reality benchmark report valued at $1,500. I want to remind everyone that our, all of our shows are archived and available at calltalk.tv any time of the day. And now I'd like to introduce the host of Call Talk, Bruce Belfiore. Okay, thanks very much, Brian, and welcome back to Call Talk, everyone. Uh, today's topic is site selection, and to discuss this, I'm really delighted to welcome our guest, Kristen Beatty. Kristen has a really great background in finance analytics, stemming from her time with IBM in their global services division, and currently she's the managing director of C.B. Richard Ellis's Labor Analytics Group, where her responsibilities include development of analytical models for use in labor assessment and site selection. And Kristen has also been fortunate to have gained firsthand experience through extensive interviews and on-site assessments while researching and evaluating potential labor markets. Uh, we all know that Call Talk is a vendor-free zone, so Kristen will be talking about research, not really making a sales pitch. But, but you'll get a sense and a flavor for the breadth and depth of knowledge that she brings to her craft and the value that this research has really added to our industry and I think we should all be uh, be grateful for her. So thank you for joining us, Kristen. Thanks, Bruce. It's a pleasure to join. Okay, great. Well, Kristen, we know how important site selection is for brick-and-mortar call centers, uh, that old real estate adage, uh, location, 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 uh, applies to call centers too, not just to homes. And uh, people who pick the wrong spot to put their centers can really regret their mistake in a big way. That's true, Bruce. Uh, call centers, as most of you know, uh, typically have their highest cost driven by labor. So identifying the right labor markets across the U.S. and even the world is crucial for the long-term sustainability of call centers. Mm. Well, you know, Kristen, some of our listeners may remember the research that uh, we did together, that is to say Benchmark Portal and C.B. Richard Ellis, uh, several years ago in which we overlaid CBRE's uh, demographic database with our performance metrics database uh, to determine the location characteristics of the best-performing call centers. And so, uh, you know, to try to figure out where, if, you know, one was going to be looking for a place to put up a center, what, what were the kind of demographic uh, characteristics that seemed to go along with the best-performance metrics? And uh, at that time, the sites that were in semi-rural or suburban locations uh, with relatively high unemployment and uh, few or no other call centers around and uh, a local two-year community college thrown into the mix uh, seemed to outperform centers in, in other locations on average. Uh, has anything changed over the last few years, in your opinion? You know, those are still the primary uh, factors that we're looking at for most call centers, um, you know, where we find uh, most of our clients looking to be preferred employers. And those sorts of demographics really aid to a long-term sustainable market uh, where they can be uh, an employer of choice in the location. Um, so there's still the front runners for most call centers. Uh, we still see most of our customer service locations going to smaller or moderate size um, markets that 
uh, can support a smaller or moderate size center themselves, um, and really focusing in on less competition and where their wage can really be more meaningful in the market and present more of a uh, wage arbitrage for the client um, and, and company itself. So mm -hmm. Tier 2, Tier 3 markets are still um, you know, predominantly chosen, uh, especially with minimal competition. Um, it allows for lower wage rates, reduced attrition, and really that uh, preferred employer opportunity. And saturation levels, um, that was a big portion of the study uh, you know, that we did together, looking at that 2 to 3% um, level, which is really critical in identifying the level of competition in a market. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and the saturation level, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, can you sort of define that for our listeners and uh, give them an idea of what you've seen over time in terms of uh, the things to watch out for there? Sure. So saturation is the percentage of the labor force that is in um, call centers. So we're looking at um, you know, a 2% call center or a 2% saturation rate would mean that 2% of the overall labor force within that commute area um, would be employed in call center markets. Um, the, the major things that we've looked for with that um, and, and opportunities and challenges is typically what we see is a saturation level below 2% when we're tracking competitions in these markets. Uh, tends to be a, an indicator that it's going to be less competitive and you have a better opportunity to be an employer of choice. Um, what I would say, you know, going back to your original question as far as what may have changed over time, is mm -hmm. although that indicator is still crucial, um, we do see some companies that uh, divert from the main strategy. So there are companies that tend to go in and want a trained and experienced applicant pool uh, that is already well-versed in call center experience. And so those companies may be looking for, to pay a slightly higher wage um, than the rest of the market and actually look for markets that are moderately saturated. So maybe closer to that 3 to 4% um, area of mm -hmm. saturation. Um, but it's, again, not for everyone. If you're coming in looking for a low-cost opportunity, you really want to be targeting below that 2 to 3% uh, threshold. Um, and, and, again, with markets that align with your starting wage to be a preferred employer to really be successful and face minimal competition. Mm, yeah. You know, I think a lot of people aren't aware of uh, the percentage of people who are employed in the call center area nationwide. Uh, do you have an up-to-date figure? Because it used to be between 3 and 4% nationwide. Is that still the case? Uh, yeah, the average metric is right around 2.7% um, mm -hmm. um, is what we see as an average call center uh, saturation rate right now. Okay, okay. Which is, makes this, ours a, really a huge industry, and a lot of people don't uh, even appreciate that. I can remember seeing a metric for the United Kingdom, which was 3.9-something, uh, a few years ago, so uh, you know we're we're really in a, a huge global industry in terms of uh, call centers. Well, w when you look at uh, the best markets for call center locations, what what are the things that you use to determine what you're looking for? Sure. Um, well, first of all, you know there's several critical factors to examine saturation, obviously being one of them, the level of competition in the market. Um, but what's really crucial at the very beginning is to identify the type of skill set for that call center. Um, I think we've all seen some pretty uh, wide variety of what is defined as a call center. It can be anything from your basic customer service, um, claims, collections, all the way up to nurses answering the phone. So mm -hmm. we really want to define the type of skill and labor that is going to be employed in that market mm -hmm. and then align quality, cost, um, and, and supply with that, uh, that requirement. You know, the, what's great here, Kristen, is that uh, you're going back to the actual customer and to the call. I mean, this is the the right way to do things. It's what we always tell uh, our people who we work with in call centers to do. So you're sort of going back to the source instead of, you know, starting out at a high level. You're going back to, to what kind of call are we talking about, and therefore what kind of call or call center employee are we, do we need. And, uh, you know, is this a, a, a call center for home improvement, or do you need licensed brokers for a Wall Street brokerage firm, you know? And and so I, I think that's perfect. It, it, you should always start with the customer and the call, even when looking at call site call center sites. Well, let me ask you, uh, what skills have you seen frequently identified for call center site selection? Sure. Um, you know, as I mentioned, it, it varies. You know, we see quite a bit on the customer service side. Uh, we have seen a growing amount in technical support. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, in financial services, we see everything from, you know, customer service, underwriters, and then even to your point, mortgage advisors, 
um, healthcare, we see everything from claims to, um, you know, we've worked with several companies putting registered nurses on the phone, which you can imagine, um, you know, the type of market that can support registered nurses and put 200 nurses on the phone versus a basic customer service requirement really changes the types of markets that you're trying to target. And it's, you know, back to your point, um, why we have to go back to the main client um, and what the call is and, and what they're servicing. And there's no true top 10 um, list out there for call centers because really each call center is different each call is different mm, okay so we can't really have like a forbes uh 10 base places to retire <laughs> list for this kind of thing it really is a, a custom uh objective really to look at uh where what site might be best for you uh, based on your specific needs um yeah well what as you look at the skills what are some of the critical factors that, that indicate the best location? Can you make that connection for us? Because I think this is a fascinating area. Absolutely. Um, you know, we tend to focus on three or four groupings of indicators. So looking at supply, cost, quality, and then the business environment itself. Um, you know, supply ranges, um, indicators can range from general populace, you know, labor force, and can get very specific to education levels. Um, we actually track very specific, um, you know, degree graduation rates. Mm -hmm. um, we can look at the density of the specific industry, language capability of the market, and there may be specific factors you're looking for. Um, perhaps a certain age grouping is very um, uh, high in performance for your center, or looking at, um, you know, Series 6 employees, you know, if you're looking for a, a certain registration. Um, so that, that really so that would be uh, the Series 6, Series 7 brokers. That would be for the uh, brokerage industry, correct? Yeah, exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. um, okay. and, Sorry and to interrupt so, there, but. And we can yep. even break that supply down greater. Um, you know, we track um, over 800 different specific occupations, so we can build customized applicant pools on the supply side as well. So we see those as critical indicators because if you don't have the supply to start with, you know, really it won't matter how much you pay if you can't attract enough um, people to fill the seats and to, to yield the calls and the volume that you're trying to handle. Mm. Um, in addition, I look at cost. Um, so, again, depending on the type of strategy that the company is looking for, it may be a low-cost center um, or maybe it's not as big of a, a driver. Maybe they are coming in, like the example I gave earlier, looking to pay a higher amount. Um, but we look at everything from, you know, your living expenses and income levels down to the very specific starting wages that we see their competition paying in a market. And that is a true art form. There's no publication out there um, that tracks it as consistently and continually as you really need to identify the dynamics of a call center market. Um, what we found is there's many third-party resources um, that we will use as um, you know, supporting documents, but as most of our listeners have probably noticed, if you go into a market that is fairly competitive, you may see wage increases happening, you know, every quarter by 25, 50 cents an hour easily, mm -hmm. and that can um, dramatically change the cost that that market is going to present for your uh, your center. So we actually conduct our own surveys for that, and I would recommend that anyone looking to do site selection, um, you know, investigates that primary research, um, whether it's on their own or through um, a consultant. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, I, I can tell you from uh, experience with a couple of clients last year that, uh, you know, there were a couple of uh, site selection um, projects that were well-intentioned and which sort of came up with a good site from some high-level points of view but didn't go into this kind of level of detail. And now those sites are finding it difficult to find the right people and to, uh, you know, put their wage rates in an area that can make them a preferred employer. And it's very hard when you get into a place and you're the underdog trying to attract people in. What you end up doing, as I'm sure you've seen before, is uh, you end up training people for the call center sector that then end up going to your competition in the area, right? Exactly, and that's why we put such a large emphasis on our primary research. Um, you know, demographics will tell you only so much. They're a great way to get you to a shorter list of um, potential candidate markets. So if you start out with all of the, um, you know, cities in the U.S. with a population of over 10,000, that starts you off with a list of 4,000 markets. Mm -hmm. um, once you start looking at the demographics, that may get you to a short list of 100 or 200. 
but mm -hmm. what you have to keep in mind is that your competition is probably looking at those same demographics to start, and there's somewhat of a mob mentality. You don't want to go to just the top markets demographically because more than likely most of your competition is already there. And so you really want to peel that onion back a little further, investigate you know, who is there, what are they paying, how big are they, and how are we going to compete with them. You know, If they're paying $13 an hour and have 2,000 employees, and you're coming in with 500 and paying 10, you're going to have a very difficult time. And so really, you know, from a site selection standpoint, when you're starting out with a new site, you know, let's really get all those facts aligned to start with to make sure that you come in at that preferred employer piece, and then how can you remain there? Right, right. Okay, great. Well, before we get to uh, some questions from uh, people in the audience, uh, have you seen any trends regarding size or wages paid by companies across the U.S. in general? I mean, you've been talking about size, you've been talking about wages. Uh, what, what are the, the actual trends that you see on the ground? Sure. Um, so, you know, again, it really varies by a company strategy. What we see on average is the, the typical size center is really between three to 500 um, on average. Um, our database shows that in um, Tier 1 markets, you tend to actually pay more. Um, and you tend to have larger centers. Um, so, for example, uh, in 2009, Tier 1 markets were averaging around 11.36 an hour for call centers with a saturation rate of 2.9%, so just above that national average I mentioned earlier. Um, but that's 17% greater than the average starting wage in a Tier 3 market, which is about 9.67 an hour. So, you know, the size and wage that you're trying to target from a corporate strategy is really going to define the types of markets that can support you. Um, you know, Tier 1s, we see the greatest experience level. So if um, a, a company is really looking to diversify um, the types of skill sets that they're trying to employ or they're those higher-level call centers, um, mm -hmm. then we see them locating in the Tier 1, but then they miss out on some of the arbitrage opportunities in Tier 3 markets. Um, so really, you know, we, we see a, a variety. Um, the largest centers are in financial services from a trend standpoint. They tend to average just a little over 500 seats. Uh, where healthcare, they tend to have smaller centers, uh, much more focused calls, and trying to find that number of um, healthcare experienced employees in a market, um, that supply is much more restricted. So it tends to drive a smaller center. They average around 247 seats per operation. Mm -hmm. And then finally, um, from a trend, outsourcers really have the highest percent location in Tier 3 markets. So those smaller markets, they're really able to take advantage of that labor arbitrage and, and identify lower cost opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, actually, about 27% of all outsourcing call centers are located in Tier 3, which is the largest um, percentage in Tier 3 markets across industries. Um, the one thing that they need to watch out for that we've noticed in our analysis um, is because that supply is restricted in a Tier 3, um, if volumes go up and you start to increase the hiring in one of those markets, you can very easily cannibalize a Tier 3 market, um, whether it's by growth, as I mentioned, if there's a new contract signed or an exceptional amount of uh, volume and calls that you're having to hire headcount for, or if it's attrition rates, um, you can churn through that labor market very quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I can imagine, too, that uh, you have uh, another challenge if you're an outsourcer, and that is you're not quite sure what's going to be coming in the door in terms of uh, requests to you. Yeah. And so uh, somebody may start off giving you a certain kind of call that requires a certain kind of labor uh, profile, if you will, and then they say, okay, you know, this is working really well. Now I'd like you to add on this uh, higher uh, value-add area and it may be very hard for you to, in fact, match that request. Absolutely. You know, we've worked with um, several outsourcing companies actually testing multiple skill sets across their market. So mm -hmm. um, even if they're only employing customer service in a market today, uh, but there's a potential they may need to apply uh, technical support or sales to another contract or even to the same. We've tested those markets to see, you know, if those volumes were to grow or if contracts uh, needed to be able to shift around, uh, which markets would be able to support technical support or sales and, and really investigate that proactively. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll add that the most interesting use that I've seen um, outsourcers use this information for is actually relaying it directly back to their sales force. So after the labor market has been identified and they know which ones are their best positioned for specific skill sets, they'll give that information to their sales team. And as their sales team is connecting with the captive users, um, you know, looking to fill that volume, 
they can actually sell specifically which markets will best fit those um, skill sets and show the labor market research for that. And it's been a, a success for them as far as bringing it to that sales team and bringing it directly to their clients. And in the long run, it's helping them um, to make sure that the clients understand uh, which markets are going to be most successful, and they don't push them to fill volume in markets that aren't going to be able to sustain their requirement and end up with higher costs from their operating standpoint. Well, that makes so much sense. I mean, really get the uh, square pegs and square holes and help them align their marketing efforts so that they get in the kind of business that, in fact, is going to make them successful and, and make their clients successful. Uh, that's great. Uh, we've got a question in from a listener, so I'm going to turn it over to Brian to ask that question. Brian? Hey, Bruce. Uh, yeah, this is me. I just want to double-check that you guys can hear me. Yes, we can. Super. Okay. Uh, well, uh, yeah, all of our listeners, uh, whether you're listening in on the phone or off, off of Call Talk, make sure that uh, you send us some of your questions. We'll make sure that we get the most out of our time today. So this is a question from Michelle from Minneapolis, and she asks, uh, how do you evaluate the sustainability of a market? Mm, good question. That's a great question, um, and really goes back to that point I was making about cannibalizing a market and making sure that it has the long-term uh, labor force needs that you have over time. Um, the way we approach it is actually a very sophisticated supply-demand model system. Um, we call it Labor Plan, which is uh, an, a model that we won the Global Innovators Award for back in 2007. Okay, and we and used this, is, it, this is Labor Plan, not Labor Pains, right, Kristen? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Labor Plan, hopefully, hopefully solving for Labor Pains, right? <laughs> um yeah, so the, the model allows us to look at what the available applicant pool is for the specific skill set. So going back to my comment earlier about having a um, list of over 800 occupations, we actually customize that by the skill set you're trying to target. And again, we can do multiple skill sets per market to help you know solve for which skill sets might work best. Um, and identify that supply, and then we look at um, how much of that supply is available to you at the starting wage that you're offering, um, what sort of demand is there both from your size, growth, attrition rates, as well as what your competition's um, demand is on that market. And we can actually measure the number of hiring cycles that that supply will last you, um, so equaling longevity in, in terms of years, um, and what that risk level is. So how sustainable is that market? Are you positioned well with an ample labor force that provides you, you know, multiple years of sustainability and a, a preferred employer positioning? Or is it already limited um, and you might be at a high risk? And it can really vary um, the reasons why that market is limited. Um, I've worked with clients that it's purely a supply issue. They're paying 2 $3 an hour over the market, but they can't mm. find people. And the reason is, is that that labor force is limited, and the demand on it, both by themselves or by their competition, is just too great. That Even if they hired everyone and their brother, they're not going to fill the requirement. Um, or it could be a wage positioning issue or an attrition issue, um, but the model actually allows us to conduct sensitivity analysis to back into what are the drivers that are causing um, any sort of problems or what are the drivers that make this market an opportune area to grow and expand in, um, or what other skill sets could be solved for in this market if, you know, perchance it's actually not performing well in one particular area, how can you actually use it for something else? So it allows us to test how long it will last, um, and we use it quite often for uh, portfolio planning. So let's look at all 10 markets, understand the longevity of these markets. Let's keep the ones that can handle expansion or have the longest um, sustainability, and let's slowly start exiting out or finding a new use for um, mm. the markets that are already at high risk and might have an issue with either cost or supply down the road. Gosh, I can see where your financial planning background would help out here because sort of people at different stages in their careers and their lives you have different planning objectives and they need to transition from one to the next and sort of take the long-term view. You, you do more or less the same sort of thing uh, on behalf of your clients, right, in terms of uh, looking at these, this whole labor analytics and, and site selection uh, area. Yeah, it was a it was an easy transition from looking at, you know, data and and where are the gaps to solve and and pushing that, you know, into labor versus um, you know, financial statements. Mhm. Mm okay, great. Uh Brian, do we have another question from the audience? 
Yeah, we sure do. And again, I want to remind everyone that you can send us your questions through calledtalk.tv or just uh, press the one on your phone. That will raise your hand so I can uh, know that you have a question. But I want to thank uh, Michelle already for the first question and want to thank Dwayne from Phoenix for this question. Dwayne asks, what as call center managers, can we do to utilize or benefit from site selection or longevity analysis? That's a great question. Um, you know, and most of the information I've talked about so far has been at a port le our portfolio level, which is where we see you know more of the long-term strategy work. Um, but first of all, I would say as a call center manager, um, you know, by being involved in this process in site selection, you're really helping to start out in the right market. So identifying the market that you're going to be serving um, or being integrated into a new decision for a new market um, is key. That way you're starting out positioned for success, um, which markets are going to have the supply, cost, and quality that I need um, to be able to meet metrics and really um, make my uh, center perform well. Um, so going in um, and understanding that and, and how your uh, market might, um, you know, be impacted by fluctuating volume or expansion requirements. Um, you know, one thing I've seen is oftentimes, you know, you have an overall contract requirement or the strategy for the company is to expand certain markets, and they push it down to that call center and really the manager understands can this market expand or not and having this sort of statistical background you know to say wait a second you know we've looked at the numbers the supply shows that it it's working great now we're perfectly sized but if we grow it could cannibalize this and so having that sort of background to push back to your management team and even to you know pull from them and say we should be looking at this market for further expansion um is a great opportunity i think for the direct managers um, you know, as companies begin to um, recover from this economy, I think we've seen um, quite a bit of targeted growth. Hopefully we're coming out of this consolidation mode where we've seen a lot of these centers closing um, and pushing into more of, you know, where should we be expanding, what should our long-term, um, you know, bets be. Um, so I think that, that helps quite a bit. Um, I think the more objective reasoning you can bring to the table to discuss with your executive team, um, the more it's appreciated. Um, obviously, we all have stakes in our individual centers, um, but if you can bring this sort of analysis and show exactly why um, the, a certain market is well positioned, I think that's a, a great aid and, and a benefit for a call center manager and how you can be helping to add value to the portfolio decisions in your uh, company. And then I think um, you know another opportunity is just understanding the opportunities that are in your market. So maybe your um, your center is only handling customer service today, um, but there are growth needs for technical support, collections, claims. You know maybe even higher end underwriting and mortgage. Um, you know how does your uh, center in, in your market uh, position for some of those skill sets? Um, so knowing that proactively, you can help guide what could grow there. And also, if your market is very difficult to operate in, um, you know, maybe it doesn't work for customer service and you're struggling um, because of the supply and cost of the market, um, you know, what else could you substitute there to keep that center going um, but maybe substitute the skill set? So I think that could be a huge benefit for um, your direct call center managers and then, you know, just finally, I would say, you know, right-sizing, you know, hitting the right wage, this sort of analysis can really help say, wait, we know what our competition is paying. Mm -hmm. um, we know what size we can handle in this market. Let's position ourselves to be an employer of choice in this market and get the type of quality employees we need so that we can have, you know, uh, you know the, the right sort of first call resolution and, and mean times and all of the SLAs that you're measured against. Great. Okay, great. Uh, really good uh, information that brings it right down to the uh, call center manager level. I think we've got a couple more questions, uh, quick questions here from Brian. Uh, if we could get those in before we, we finish. Yeah, you bet. Uh, these two are really good and uh, very appropriate, especially with today's economy and, with, and the way things are going. Uh, I'll ask them both, and then Kristen and Bruce will let you guys uh, approach them as you see fit. The first one comes from John out of Michigan. His question is, how do at-home agents fit into your analysis? That's a good one. The second question is from Anita in Utah. She asks, how should business continuity be included in the analysis of site selection? Take it away. Great questions. Great questions. Okay, over, over to you, Kristen. 
<laughs> Thanks so much. Um, well, home agents, um, we include often, um, we've actually done quite a bit of research on home agents, and we've actually looked at specific indicators that can identify, um, you know, who mo might be more likely to be a home agent in the labor force. So um, specific demographics like armed forces or potential retirees, um, individuals that have a longer commute shed, um, you know, if, if they're driving further than, say, a 20-mile radius, which is what we see as a, a typical commute radius for most markets, um, you know, if, if all of a sudden you can extend that out to a 30 or 40-mile radius by capturing home agents, you can actually expand the supply that's available to your market um, and actually be able to handle additional volume or, or calls uh, there. So I think that's crucial, um, and, and that's how we integrate it is looking at those sort of demographic indicators and then obviously primary research um, as well. For the the second question, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Bruce. Yeah, just on that one. Well, what about just sort of the total virtualization? I mean, you could be in Alaska and uh, working with a brick and mortar operation that might be in Montana or something like that. I mean, uh, does the um, at home agent phenomenon really change the game in, in a certain sense? It does to an extent. Um, you know, it really depends on the technology that the company is employing and the, and the cost strategy that they have. Mm -hmm. um, you know, handling someone in Alaska for a hub that's, you know, say in Michigan um, is possible, but, you know, is there need for training? Can they virtualize 100% of that training? Um, does that person still feel connected to the culture of the center? You know, those are things that our clients have pointed out can sometimes be a risk at 100% virtualization. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, it does change the game quite a bit if you can suddenly hire from anywhere um, and your your labor market becomes you know infinite in a way um, and, and another point I think is is good to research here and it's more of an art um, and and trying to solve for the performance and behavioral characteristics of a home agent um, you know we often see that star performers in a typical call center um, do worry do very well because of the environment that they're in um, when you take that star out of a call center environment and put them back at home um, how does that impact their performance? Um, sometimes it's not the best um, situation or culture for everybody, so it's really a behavioral choice. You know, who's going to work well? Um, you know, who can have the level of, um, you know, autonomy and be able to really hold themselves to uh, measurables on their own and then has the environment at home to be able to um, handle those calls as well. They're not in a one-bedroom apartment with, you know, a bunch of noise in the background. They're able to handle that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, great. Yeah. And then um, the second question on business continuity, um, I think that is crucial. Um, you know, if you're looking at site selection, especially if it's a replacement or relocation option, um, one thing that we've looked at is if the site selection is within the same market, we'll look at um, what that disruption might be to your employees. So if you're looking at, um, you know, the north side of town versus the southeast, um, and look at where your current employees are, how does that commute shed um, and disruption change? You know, are you actually capturing more individuals that might have been commuting from that area of town to your old center? You know, by relocating, can you actually keep most of them? Or where are some of your top performers at, um, you know, and, and making sure that you uh, keep them in the same market? If you're going to a different market, um, I think it's really about having that overlap, and it's a cost that a company needs to consider if they're doing a relocation or even just starting to transition volume from one market to another is, you know, you can't ramp down 100% in one market and ramp up 100% in another at the same time. There's going to need to be some uh, level of overlap where maybe you're at 50% in one market um, and you're slowly ramping up, you know, to 50% in another um, to be able to start transitioning those calls and for there to be no disruption to your business. So I think it is critical, um, but it's mostly in how that um, operationally is handled so that your um, call volumes are well maintained and your clients don't feel um, any sort of impact. Right. I was uh, working with uh, a couple of call centers in Florida, and they were in two separate locations in Florida, but both of them both very prone to hurricanes. And, in fact, uh, in one famous case, they were in the path of one hurricane that had come through and <laughs> would have uh, uh, potentially done real damage to both of them. So they were talking about uh, going somewhere totally different to uh, be able to have, um, you know, the kind of redundancy that they felt that they needed. And so even if they couldn't handle 100% of their calls in the case of a, um, you know, a, a terrible hurricane disaster, they'd at least be able to what we call fail soft instead of failing hard and maybe just have uh, longer uh, average speed of answers and things like that. So 
Yeah, and Bruce, you bring up a, a great point on, um, you know, as far as business continuity goes, I was thinking about it more, you know, in that transition period, but we have several clients, you know, based on just the pure site selection alone, looking at, um, you know, is there going to be severe or extreme weather impacts, um, whether it's ice storms or hurricanes or tornadoes, and a, a lot of times our clients will specifically say, you need to exclude those regions, identify them for us and exclude them from the analysis, and we'll show them you know, specific maps and help them to understand where their risks are and, and why certain markets may be eliminated because of those factors so that it doesn't impact any sort of, um, you know, disruption to their um, redundancy or any of their calls. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, great. Well, this has been a great session. We've uh, actually got overshot our usual time, but uh, I'm glad we did because there's just been a lot of uh, juicy information and uh, good things for our, our listeners. So with that, I'll uh, thank you very much, Kristen, for being on with us, and thank everybody for listening, and uh, pass it over to Brian. All right. Thanks, Bruce, and thanks, Kristen. I can tell you have uh, a whole uh, plethora full of knowledge and experience still yet to share with us. So unfortunately, the time is up, and uh, it was very nice to have you on the show today. So it is now time to give away our free in-depth reality check to one of our listeners. And today, congratulations to Anita. That's a $1,500 value, so make sure you email me at brian at benchmarkportal.com so I can get that to you. And again, thanks, Kristen and Bruce, for all the insightful comments that you brought to the show today. And of course, thanks to everyone for listening in, whether you're listening live or one of our archived shows. I want to make sure you join us January 5th for the next Call Talk with Chief Morale Officer Kirk Weisler. And uh, if you, we used your question today, please email us at brian at benchmarkportal.com so we can send you Bruce's book, Benchmarking at its Best. Don't forget to sign up for a free Reality Check Benchmark Report to see how your call center compares to others in your industry. Our in-depth Reality Check Benchmark Report takes a much deeper dive into call center's metrics and is free today for our winner, Anita. I'm Brian Carrington, hoping everyone has a wonderful day. <laughs>